nanohub.org. Online simulation and more for nanotechnology. Okay, so now the next part I'm going to talk about uh, using photonic crystals as enabling technology for guided wave interconnects. Um, but first I'll need to explain what is the basic concept of photonic crystals. So photonic crystals are in a broad sense based on the concept of Bragg reflection. Uh, so many of you already know what Bragg reflection is. It basically says that if you have an array of scatterers, which is shown here, then these scatterers will actually uh, create coherent interference of multiple layers of scattering, basically in this top layer and then second layer and third layer. Uh, at specific wavelengths and angles. And those wavelengths and angles are dictated by the Bragg law, which basically says that the, the kind of the first order and uh, higher order wavelengths are basically uh, dictated by uh, twice the period A in the lateral direction times cosine of the angle of incidence theta. Uh, so that's basically shown here. And then you can see that if you have uh, two different angles, then there will also be two different wavelengths that are being uh, refracted. And so that means that over uh, a given frequency or frequency range, there's usually a range of angles that can be strongly reflected by periodic media. And then this uh, graph here is just showing an example of reflection as a function of frequency for various uh, angles. And so of course you can see that different angles have different reflection frequency ranges. Um, so to be more uh, precise about what's happening, uh, you can think about the concept of photonic band structures. So just like we had talked about before, semiconductors have band gaps. Uh, photonic crystal structures where you have periodic arrays of high and low dielectric materials act kind of like uh, a semiconductor such as gallium arsenide with high and low uh, refractive indices in this case. Uh, so you can see that if you just take a piece of gallium arsenide and then you try to calculate the photonic band structure, you essentially have the normal dispersion relation for uh, photons. And so if you look at the x-axis, that's showing the wave vector, and then the y-axis is showing the frequency. Um, and it's uh, folded in on itself because there's a so-called Brillouin zone which is determined by the periodicity of the structure. But basically what you get is uh, that the dispersion omega, which is the y-axis, equals ck over n, where k is the wave vector. And so this c over n is basically the speed of light in a given medium of refractive index n. So this is very well known, very simple uh, from undergraduate optics. However, once you add in two different layers with different refractive indices, then you create a band gap. And if you have like a very small index contrast, then you have a small band gap. However, as the index contrast becomes larger, in this case, you can see on the third graph that there's basically uh, gallium arsenide and aluminum arsenide, which are uh, MBE growth compatible because they have almost the same lattice constant. Then you get a much more pronounced band gap or range of frequencies that are fully reflected across all wave vectors or angles. Okay, so that's really the key takeaway. And then this graph on the right-hand side is just showing what the field uh, localization looks like above and below the band gap. But basically what you find out is that um, if you're in a relatively high index region, that gives you lower frequency and then vice versa. Uh, so then uh, there's no uh, intermediate state that can exist inside this uh, band structure based on Bloch's theorem. So then you end up with this band gap. And you can basically uh, also make waveguides out of these sort of 1D photonic crystals, uh, which are shown here. And so this is just showing you basically you take two of these 1D photonic crystals and then you leave a gap in between them. And that gap can be a waveguide. And so that waveguide is oftentimes called a defect level in the photonic crystal and basically is setting a specific frequency that is high, highly guided because both of these materials on the top and bottom uh, are reflecting light. And so the light basically bounces back and forth in this waveguide. So this is called a Bragg grading waveguide type structure. Um, 
But you can even do more complicated structures, uh, which also have band gaps. One example is a 2D photonic crystal, where you have periodicity both in the x and y directions, perhaps making uh, rods out of some high dielectric material and then putting them into air. So schematically, it's shown here, and maybe like the 2D structure looking from top down view looks like this. And then the period is on the order of maybe uh, half a micron, then you've got a band gap wavelength around 1.5 microns, which is suitable for telecom applications. If you look at the 2D photonic crystal structure, again, you have the same kind of Bragg condition uh, that will set the characteristic frequency at which reflection occurs. And so you again work at very similar types of dispersion relations, which are shown here. Uh, where basically you go up in frequency and then there's the band gap because there's localization in two different regions of the photonic crystal. If you try to calculate the exact uh, 2D photonic band structure, then you get something like this where uh, depending on the polarization of light, you can either get a relatively large band gap in the case of transverse magnetic uh, modes. So in other words, modes where uh, the magnetic field is exclusively in the plane, and then the electric field is out of the plane, as shown in this diagram here. So you see this diagram uh, has a photonic crystal uh, from the top-down perspective. So the magnetic fields are all in this plane, like this way or this way. Uh, so X and Y components, and then E is in the Z direction out of the board. Um, and then if you look at the TE modes, however, which are in red, then you don't have as much of a band gap. The reason why they act so differently is because of the boundary conditions and the problem. Uh, to wit, um, the magnetic fields have to have a continuity of the uh, B parallel and uh, E per sorry E parallel and B perpendicular across these boundaries. And so, because there's a, a a continuity of E parallel, that causes a gap if you're localized in the high uh, dielectric regions versus low dielectric regions. With the TE modes, however, uh, you can have uh, D perpendicular is conserved, and so th uh, the energy gap between the two modes is very small. Um, so basically, uh, if the index contrast is large enough in this 2D photonic band gap, then you get what's called a complete or omnidirectional band gap, where Regardless of the specific uh, direction, then you get a dispersion relation uh, that overlaps with other angles. Okay, so that's basically what this graph is showing here. So this yellow region means that regardless of incident angle, you still have like the reflection over that range of frequencies. And just to show you what the modes look like in both cases, you can actually see that for the TM modes, that there's not necessarily like a really huge contrast compared to uh, before, but you basically have modes that are like highly localized in high dielectric regions, or you have modes that are actually delocalized outside of the high dielectric regions. Um, so then basically things like this. And so this is from the Photonic Crystals textbook by Joe Anopoulos et al. So uh, just to kind of summarize what kind of photonic crystals we can have. Uh, so these 1D type structures are basically multi-layer stacks, or they can be like perpendicular, as shown here, uh, where basically you have a grading type structure. 2D photonic crystals can either be an array of uh, rods in air, or they can also be an array of holes in a slab. And then this is an experimental picture of the 2D structure. And then you can also have more complex 3D structures. Uh, and of course, you can see these 3D structures are fairly complex, but I'm going to talk about a relatively simple way to fabricate uh, 3D structures that are uh, amenable to large scale fabrication, rel relatively uh, relevant for telecom applications. So uh, basically, the key takeaways or properties that we care about going forward are going to be that there's uh, a continuous uh, band, uh, basically for frequency versus the wave vector. And there's certain ranges where frequencies are uh, 
essentially fully reflected, and that's what we call the band gap. So that means we have reduced our zero density of photonic modes. And we also have like a strong dependence in terms of direction of propagation on frequency um, and then potentially uh, anisotropy as well. Uh, but basically the feature size is really the most critical factor. So if we compare uh, to other types of optical materials in general, um, on the kind of the far left or right hand side here, we have basically ray optics or essentially uh, kind of conventional lenses. And then you get basically into the diffraction grading regime. And so that's getting close to photonic crystals where light comes in and then it gets uh, Bragg diffracted by the Bragg law that we just talked about. And then if you go a little further into uh, shorter periods, then you get photonic crystals. And there's also potential for these so-called metamaterials where actually the feature sizes are deeply sub-wavelength, uh, which is just short of a homogeneous medium. So metamaterials sometimes act like effective media or media that has an effective refractive index much different from what you see naturally, particularly at certain wavelengths. So that basically just gives you a broad overview of what kinds of materials we have potentially to work with. Um, but I think the easiest way to remember this is that it's a new uh, type of material, uh, which is like a semiconductor for light. So that means that you have the potential to use even like relatively uh, uh, well-established nanofabrication concepts to make uh, like a completely new set of uh, materials and structures that can be, uh, like I said in the last slide, um, lower cost and higher manufacturability, as well as lower power potentially as than before.